the same way that an actual brain worm can parasitize the mind of a host, therefore the, the host no longer behaves in its best interest, I argue that in the, human beings can be parasitized not by only brain worms, but by idea pathogens. Hey, welcome to Return to Reason. My name is David Craig. Excited to be with you guys. You know, as a distinguished professor at Concordia University, Dr. Gad Sad has made quite a stir here in Canada simply for speaking the truth of his scientific academia, how evolutionary biology affects human behavior. He's an outspoken champion for free thinking, freedom of speech, and revealing the harms created by woke ideologies. The refreshing thing about Dr. Sad is that all of his opinions are based on the scientific method and his personal lived experience. His fourth book, The Parasitic Mind, has sold millions of copies worldwide, and his upcoming book, The Sad Truth About Happiness, is already available for pre-order. You're going to love this candid conversation about why society thinks and acts the way that it does. Today, a special episode of Return to Reason, where knowledge and wisdom intersect. Well, Gad, welcome to Return to Reason. I so appreciate your time for joining us. I'm excited uh, to chat. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Yeah, we're doing well. It's been a good day. Hey, um, I mentioned our title of Return to Reason, and that seems to be something that uh, you could almost say is a mantra of yours, as, as you seem to be, as you quote yourself in your book, The Parasitic Mind, a combative brawler when it comes to uh, fighting against groupthink and, and ideological tribalism, in a sense. Um, but that isn't how you started off, per se. You've almost had this, this evolution or this transformation in your career. Maybe if you don't mind, let our audience know a little bit about your history, where you came out of, and how you've ended up as uh, what, what some people might call a provocateur when it comes to uh, free think. Right. Uh, so I started my career uh, seeking to apply evolutionary psychology, which yeah. is basically the application of evolutionary theory to the study of the most important organ that we possess, which is our mind. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why is it that we think the way that we do? Why is it that our emotional system is built the way that it is? And so it's, as I said, applying evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology to study the human condition. And my goal being housed in a business school was to apply those uh, frameworks to the study of our consumatory nature. Yeah. Uh, how do hormones affect women's food behaviors? Uh, how does testosterone affect men's conspicuous consumption? And so it, it, my scientific career is really a marriage between physiology, evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, and psychology to study consumer behavior. So it's really quite interdisciplinary. Yeah. And uh, you know, in the in the process of being a professor for many years, I noticed very early. It's, I, this is my twenty ninth year as a professor. It's it still shocks me to to think that I've been a professor for almost three decades. I still view myself as a twelve year old, you know, curious boy, <laughs> yeah. which I guess, in a sense, I am. It's part of you know maintaining a playful it. mindset. Yeah. Uh, I started seeing how uh, there was a war on reason on university campuses, not everywhere, not in every nook and cranny. But, you know, I, I, I explain in the book that there are there are two great wars that I've gone through. The first one, which I detail in chapter one of The Parasitic Mind, is uh, my childhood experiences uh, in the Lebanese Civil War, where I got to experience firsthand what happens to uh, societies when they adopt certain bad ideas like tribal identity politics, right? Sure. Everything in Lebanon is construed through the prism of which religious tribe you belong to. For sure. And being being Lebanese Jews, it, there weren't too many friends lurking in, in any corner. And so we, we had to leave under you know imminent threat of execution. So that was the first war I went through. Yeah. And then for many years, all was well uh, until I became an academic myself and started seeing these dreadful ideas proliferating from academia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is why in the book, I talk about these ideas being idea pathogens. And the reason why I talk about the parasitic mind is because in the same way that an actual brain worm can parasitize the mind of a host, mm -hmm. rendering it zombified, and, and, and therefore the, the host no longer behaves in its best interest, but it behaves in the best interest of the parasite that yeah. has taken over its brain. I argue that in the human beings can be parasitized not by only brain worms, but by 
idea pathogens. And so mm -hmm. that's how I went from, if you like, being an evolutionary psychologist and a consumer psychologist to being what I call a parasitologist of the human mind, studying how dreadful ideas can, can render us zombies, leading us to the abyss of infinite lunacy. Yeah. A hey, question on just as you're talking about idea pathogens, why as humans do you think that we are subject to, or groupthink seems to be something that can easily bring in a lot of people. Why are we so subject to that? And how can we combat it as a second question? Sure. So I'll start with the first part, you know, uh, you know, why are we susceptible to groupthink? Look, we are, we're a social species, right? Yeah. Had we been a, a, a solitary species, as is the case for countless other species, then what others think of me and how I fit within some social system would be unimportant to me. But yeah. dolphins are a social species, as are whales, as are lions. Actually, the only feline species uh, that is not solitary are lions, hmm. uh, as are dogs and wolves. And therefore, in any species where you see great sociality, it's a yeah. social species, then you're going to develop the, 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 the mental systems that cause you to really care about what people think of you. Sure. Where do I fit in? Where do I fit into the hierarchy? What do relevant others think of me? How do I measure up compared to them? So, for example, in the context of consumer behavior, keeping up with the Joneses is actually yeah. a mechanism that drives much of the economy, right? Envy. Why do those next to me have the Porsche and I don't? Yeah, yeah. Let me work harder. Let me go on debt so that I can also signal that I'm successful. So. Yeah. So the fact that we are susceptible to group thing and the herd mindset is, is hardly surprising because we're, we're a social species. Your first question, why are we susceptible to be parasitized by bad ideas? Now, that is one that I really drill down, you know, in the, in the parasitic mind. And, yeah. and I think there are different reasons depending on which idea pathogen we're talking about. So let me, for your viewers and listeners, let me give examples of what I call idea pathogen so they get a sense of what we're talking about so postmodernism is the granddaddy of all idea pathogens because it basically purports that there are no universal truths there are no yeah, objective yeah. truths we are completely constrained by relativity by subjectivity which of course is a dreadful idea pathogen because then science couldn't work totally. because science does presume that when we wake up in the morning there are certain regularities that we could study and explain and predict uh, social constructivism is another idea pathogen. It says that everything that humans are is strictly due to social construction. Why do women prefer certain types of guys? They learned it from Hollywood images. Why do men prefer certain types of women? It's Oprah and Beyonce that taught us what to prefer. There are no biological imperatives. So, and, and in the book, I discuss a whole bunch of these idea pathogens, but that still doesn't answer the question of why we're susceptible to succumb to these. Yeah, yeah. And I argue in the book that the one thing that is common across these idea pathogens is that it frees us from the pesky shackles of reality, right? They're liberating, right? So for sure. example, social constructivism is liberating because it argues that your child could truly be anything if only they were given the right socialization your mm -hmm. child could be the next Lionel Messi could be the next Michael Jordan could be the next Albert Einstein well that's a very hopeful message to me as a parent but it's perfectly rooted in nonsense because Lionel Messi did not start off life with an equal likelihood of being the great soccer player that he is as someone who would end up being six foot ten and cumbersome and so yeah. a lot of these idea pathogens uh, if you like, uh, navigate in the currency of endless hope, but they're perfectly false premises. Yeah. Hey, very important question. Just while you brought up the topic, Lionel Messi, do you consider him the greatest soccer player of all time with the World Cup win of Argentina? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, he didn't need to win the World Cup for him to be the greatest soccer player okay. ever. As a matter of fact, <laughs> one of the reasons why I weigh in on this topic so heavily, other than my love of soccer and of Lionel Messi, is because it is a perfect demonstration of irrational decision making on the part of humans. Yeah, but yeah. what winning the World Cup has done is it has removed the one thing that all of the idiots could say against Lionel Messi, which is, well, Maradona won the World Cup, but Messi didn't. Well, now you can all shut your mouths because he did win it. <laughs> and the reason why I am passionate about it yeah. is because there is there is a metaphysical anger that I get 
if you can hate on Lionel Messi, then no one is safe. Because yeah. not only is is he such a brilliant artist, but just the way he can he he acts in his personal life with such dignity, with such humility. There is nothing you could hate about Lionel Messi, but the fact that people hate him demonstrates how unfair life could be. And so it is for me cosmic justice that he finally won it. So yes, he's the greatest <laughs> soccer player ever, and he's the greatest soccer player that could ever be. Well, there you have it. It is official. Lionel Messi is the greatest of all time. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that one. Hey, you, just to back up a little bit, we talked about the, the idea of pathogen of postmodernism, which certainly both of us being in Canada, we, we see it in a, a lot of, I won't say names, but um, different leaders in our country that seem to be driven by the idea. Of, and postmodernism it has a lot of things that fall under its purview. When, you know, also as well, you mentioned the war on reason. In your career, when did you first start noticing the war on reason was starting to move mainstream and really was having an effect on mass people, I should say? So, so there are different... So, for example, the first time that I was exposed to some postmodernist gibberish was in a first, uh, first or second year doctoral course when I was a, a PhD student. But really when I saw it not only manifesting itself in academia and then, as you said, permeating to you know to the greater society is actually when i first saw it in my scientific career because it turns out uh, david that uh most people believe that biology could be applied in explaining the behavior of every species on earth except one called humans hmm. so somehow biology and evolutionary theory can explain the behavior of your dog of the mosquito yeah. of zebra of elephants, of tigers, of dolphins. But don't you dare say that biology explains human behavior. And certainly, if you're going to use evolution to explain something about the human condition, that's fine. It might explain why evolution created opposable thumbs. We've evolved opposable th thumb thumbs, but it certainly can't explain anything above the neck. So evolution mm. stops at the neck. Don't you dare say that explains the human mind. And of course, that results in all sorts of other uh, idea pathogens. So, for example, radical feminism says that there are no differences, no evolved, no biological-based differences between men and women. Everything is due to social construction. Yeah. So even the most fundamental biological differences between men and women is rejected. So I first was having that fight on reason, against reason, in my scientific career, because when I would submit a paper to a journal, prestigious journal, that wasn't open to biological ideas, it would get desk rejected, meaning yeah. it wouldn't even go out for review because mm. the editor would write back to me and, and sort of, I mean, I'm paraphrasing what they're saying, but they would say, what, what does biology have to do with behavioral sciences? What does biology have to do with consumer behavior? What do you mean? Biology has everything to do with yeah. consumer behavior. I mean. Your hormones don't suddenly stop being important when you are putting on your hat of a consumer, right? And so I first saw it in my scientific career, but then I saw it permeate everywhere, right? Because, yeah. you know, hashtag the future is female. There is nothing that a man can do that a woman can't do. And, you know, all that not stuff. Now, of course, I'm a strong supporter of equity feminism. Equity feminism simply says men and women should be treated equally under the law. And I think most of your viewers, reasonable people would say, yeah, of course they should be treated equal under the law. But the fact that equity feminism holds doesn't mean that men and women are indistinguishable from each other. We can mm -hmm. both be different while equal sure. under the law. And so uh, while I first saw this insanity in the battle in my scientific career, I quickly saw that, you know, Houston, we have a problem. These ideas might start, these kooky ideas might start off in some esoteric department in the humanities or in the social sciences, but bad ideas break out of the lab, just like actual viruses break out of a lab. Yeah. Yeah. Stupidity also breaks out of academia and eventually it infects everything. So you mentioned that even some of the scientific journals you were writing getting rejected early would be a form, in a sense, of early cancel culture before maybe the, the term was yeah. dubbed cancel culture. How has these ideas gone into academia for the negative? How has it affected our universities and school systems to the point where men who are actually free thinkers and challenging the ideas, which 
have really got us where we are in our world today and free democracy. Um, why are we on that path and how is that affecting basically academia? Well, yes, I mean, in an endless number of ways, it's negatively affecting academia and, and, and hence, forgive me not to plug again, but that's the whole point of the per why I wrote yeah. the parasitic mind. Uh, look, let's let's do a few of them. When you have thought policing, the biggest danger is not necessarily the government coming after you and stopping you from saying something or being canceled on social media. The, the, the most pervasive danger is when you create an ethos whereby people are no longer confident to speak and therefore they self-censor. So the yeah. greatest damage in the context of an academic environment where ideas should be flourishing back and forth we should be debating we should be engaged in a you know in the in the talmudic tradition you always fight back and forth back and forth right the yeah. socratic method right so the second that professors say things like i am terrified of my students because i'm afraid of saying a single word that might yeah. be misconstrued and therefore i might get canceled that's bad for the purity of the educational process. When a student writes to me and says, I'm afraid to say this, or I'm afraid to say that I like Trump, or I'm afraid to say that I support your evolutionary research, or whatever, whatever it is that they are afraid to say, that could only damage the academic system. So that's on yeah. one level, the, the, the pervasive self-censorship that happens at all levels, professors, students, students, and so on. Let's take another example. The, the ethos of diversity, inclusion, and equity, which, yep. of course, in the book, I, I organized the acronym to be the DIE cult yeah, because yeah. that's where meritocracy goes to die. Diversity, so, inclusion, and equity has no place, well, in any meritocracy. Of course, there should be no institutional barriers for any individuals from flourishing. But in many cases, we're fighting a phantom thing, right? For example... Uh, should we be better allies to women in universities today? Well, 70 years ago, we should have been because women couldn't go to medical school and couldn't go to law school and few were entering PhD programs and none were in veterinary schools. Fast forward to today, there are more women than men in every conceivable field that you can think of. So there was a problem that we faced in the past. We've redressed it correctly yeah. and we no longer face it. So... The phantom that we are fighting via diversity, inclusion, and equity, not only is it non-existent, that phantom, but it is contrary to the most fundamental tenet of science, which is your identity is irrelevant. There is no indigenous pure mathematics. There's just pure mathematics. There is no transgender neuroscience. There's just neuroscience. What the scientific method does is it liberates us from the shackles of our personal identities, right? Yeah. I'm Lebanese Jewish, but I don't do evolutionary psychology as a heterosexual Lebanese Jew who was a former uh, war refugee. I yeah. just do evolutionary psychology. So now you might say, okay, well, I get that, but what are the, the actual negative consequences of you know adhering to die? Well, yeah. here's one. Everything now is adjudicated through the die prism. If you're going to get a professorship or not, you better meet certain immutable characteristics. Are you transgender? Are you a person of color? Do you, right? It's yeah, no longer absolutely. about what my CV looks like. How yeah. about this? When I apply for a scientific grant because I want to do some research, the first thing that is cared about is not whether I'm going to cure diabetes or solve a 300-year-old math problem that nobody's able to solve. First, I have to do a, a diversity, inclusion, and equity statement, which basically yeah. says, if I were to win this grant, how will I implement diversity, inclusion, and equity at every step of my research program, yeah. in the, my methodology, in my theoretical development, in the hiring of people in my lab? Uh, imagine what Martin Luther King, who I think his birthday was yesterday, yeah. What he would say about this, right? The I have a dream speech Absolutely. was about I have a dream that my daughter would be judged on the totally. strength of her character, blah, 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 not yeah. on the color of her skin. Well, now under the cloak of progressivism, we're implementing everything that is contrary to what Martin Luther King said. Yeah. So everything is being affected in academia by this nonsense. It's looking at a man who led the charge for racial equality when race race was an issue back in the 60s is that you now have a man that you're almost disregarding 
it, it, it just blows my mind how the pendulum swing can swing so far. Hey, Gad, in just a moment, I do want to talk about your new book, um, The Sad Truth About Happiness. And I, I urge everyone listening, pre-order it. I actually pre-ordered it last night. I'm excited to read it. Uh, I do want to get to that in a moment, but you just hit on something I wanted to chat about. Uh, identity politics and, and what is our obsession and why, why do you see large companies, sports institutions that are actually starting to walk down this business of wokeness, identity politics, making the general population happy, so to speak. What's your thought? Yeah, well, it's, it's again, it's one of the, the something that I discussed quite extensively in the parasitic mind. It's because they are conflating, you know, equality of outcomes with equality of opportunities, right? Yeah. So uh, if there are more people of one race in prison than another race, there are more black people in American prisons than there are Vietnamese people. Aha, that must be due to racism, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if if there aren't enough professional hockey players in the NHL who are indigenous or who are black, aha, that's racism. So the level of imbecility, the level yeah. of stupidity is so outlandishly shocking. That's precisely why I use the metaphor of the of the parasite, because nothing else could explain the hijacking of human reason so perfectly. So yeah. th that's the reason why idiots like the NHL and all the rest of them are simply unable to, to understand that you, you're not going to have equal demographic representation in every single sphere. Look, yeah. Nobel Prizes, almost 25% of Nobel Prizes are have been won by Jews. Jews are 14 million people in the world. So the extent to which Jews are overrepresented in the Nobel Prizes is astonishing. Yeah. Well, maybe there is something in the culture of Jews that makes them be academically excellent and what makes other cultures not succeed as well academically. Yeah. But no, it must be because it's a Jewish plot. It must be because yeah. there is a hatred against indigenous people winning the Nobel Prize. It's insane. That is absolutely insane. Well, Gad, hey, tell us a bit about your book, uh, The Sad Truth About Happiness. Happiness is a pursuit of everybody. Everyone wants to be happy. If you think about it, what does people want? They work to be happy. They have family to be happy. Tell us a bit about your book. Why would you write it? Yeah, thank you. That's, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, actually, in the first uh, chapter of that book, I, I answer that question, but I'll give you a summary. So the parasitic mind, if you like, is the flip side of the coin of sure. the mind, right? It's the negative mindsets that we, we adopt that yeah. cause us to kind of be led to the abyss of infinite lunacy. But wouldn't it be nice to once in a while write about the opposite thing, right? So for example, for sure. in, in psychology, we talk about negative psychology. Why do people suffer from mental health disorders? But then positive psychology is about happiness, contentment, well-being. So that's sort of, if you like, the, the, the academic answer. But on a more personal level, Anybody who, who knows me, whether it be personally or, you know, through my social media and media engagements, knows that I'm a very affable person. I'm almost always smiling, you know, knock on wood. I yeah. always seem to be jovial. And so I would often get emails from people where they say, how is it that you're able to take on all of these things and yet you always are playful and you're joking and even though you have a very serious career? And so I would once in a while offer some advice on social media, which to me seemed like it's a blatantly obvious piece of advice. But then I would hear back from many, many people who said, oh my God, you don't know how much that piece of advice influenced me. And so I kind of had this little aha moment where I thought, you know, I never thought of being sort of a, a self-help person, but then I thought, well, wait a minute, I've got this huge platform. Yeah. I think I've got something to say about happiness. By the way, part of happiness we can't control, about 50% of happiness differences across people comes from just genetic disposition. Some of us have a sunny disposition, others have a, a less rosy disposition, but that still leaves 50% to be up for grabs that you can actually implement things to hopefully lead a, you know, a, a better life. And so I thought, you know what? I'd like to take a shot at, at writing a book that is partly personal anecdotes uh, and partly you know, rooted in, in in the science that I'm familiar with. Also bringing in ancient wisdoms, ancient Greek wisdoms, for example, the ancient Greeks wrote tons about how to live the good life and many other cultures as well. And so I thought, you know, I'm I'm very, if I may say, I'm, I'm quite uh, 
adept at weaving personal stories with science. That's one of the reasons, by the way, why I think the parasitic mind did so well, because yeah, yeah. while it contains tons of, you know, very rigorous scientific and philosophical concept, but it's also interwoven with a lot of the gadisms, the, the personal yeah, stories yeah. and so on. And so I thought, you know what, it'd be really fun to write such a book. I, you know, David, I'm not someone who's a one trick pony type of guy yeah. in that, you know what, it could have been very easy for me to milk it. Let me write the parasitic mind, the sequel part two, and yeah. I'm sure it would do very well. But I'm someone who, and I actually talk about this in the in the next book, I'm someone who really lives to some extent to the ethos of, you know, variety is the spice of life, yeah. including intellectual variety seeking. I like to explore many different intellectual landscapes. And so while I could have written, you know, book two and book three along the parasitic mind, I like to dabble in all sorts of territories. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a shot at writing a, a happiness book. Let's see how it goes. That's awesome. You know, well, you just mentioned as well a little bit about uh, wearing many hats and, and, and doing a lot of different things. You mentioned in your intro of the parasitic mind about how truth and freedom are tenants that, that guide your life, especially on the freedom side of things. And, and you feel that having a wide variety to do what you want to do has really added to your happiness. I guess the first basic question is um, if you can highlight maybe one or two things that you talk about in the book regarding what leads to a happy life? What are some of the things that jump out? Uh, absolutely, sure. Uh, but And of course, each of the chapters is a different prescription. So yeah, I'll yeah. just pick one or two sure. uh, as you asked. So uh, one, for example, is I are, so this actually the ancient Greeks were already familiar with this. Uh, even uh, Confucius had talked about this. You know, everything in moderation, the idea of everything in moderation. Yeah. Uh, Aristotle in his ethics treaties had talked about uh, a soldier. If the soldier is uh, too cowardly, that's not very good. But if he is unnecessarily reckless in his courage, then he's going to become a martyr and die. So there is yeah. some happy medium whereby some temperance between, you know, terrible cowardice and excessive unnecessary risk taking and recklessness, right? Well, I argue in one of the chapters that almost every single phenomenon that you could think of at the neuronal level, at the individual level, at the societal level, follows that inverted you. Meaning, hmm. too little of something is not good, too much of something is not good, and the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. So in that chapter, I demonstrate across a bewildering number of cases that that law of nature holds true. So the challenge, of course, is to know where the sweet spot is. So for yeah. example, when you're talking about maximal exercise efficiency. We know, for example, that if you do exercise at too low an intensity or at too high an intensity, it's less good than if you do it at, mm. at some moderate sweet spot, okay? Sure. Well, I'm excited to read it, Gad. There's, uh, it reminds me of even, for myself personally, I, I try to practice the art of gratitude because you have different things that might try to steal and take away your happiness, depending on situations. But if it, I find if I can get back to think, what am I thankful for? My wife, my, my, my family, my kids, it really helps stem that way. But hey, for our audience who's watching and, and watching this part, how can they support you? How can they connect with you? Let them know how they can uh, know what Gad Sad is up to. Thank you so much. Uh, so please, number one, go to Amazon and pre-order the sad truth, S-A-A-D, truth about happiness. Yes. It really is important because once the book is released, all of the pre-orders are instantiated and then you can quickly get on the bestseller list and then that creates a domino effect. So if you support yeah. my work, please pre-order it, number one. Number two, I host a YouTube channel and a podcast called The Sad Truth, S-A-A-D, where not unlike what we're doing here, I invite people for chats. I've been doing this for almost a decade now. You can go and subscribe to my podcast and YouTube channel and then I'm, I'm everywhere on social media. You can follow me there. Awesome. Thank you, Gad. Well, the two books as well, the, the, sad, the sad truth about happiness, looking forward to reading that. The parasitic mind seems to be the gift that keeps on giving as well, which is great. Thank you so much for your time, Gad. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're looking forward to doing this again. Thank you so much for having me. That was a fun chat. Cheers. You are an essential part of this series. Support truth, knowledge, and wisdom by sharing this show with a friend. Visit returntoreason.tv. There, you can subscribe to our newsletter by clicking Become an Insider. Get the latest articles, episodes, and exclusive content. It's Return to Reason.